of the October meeting of the Open Historical Society. We have a great program tonight, but before we start on that, uh, I want to explain the surprise that many of you may have gotten <laughs> as you walked in and through the door. Not what you saw, but what you didn't see anymore. So, Joyce <coughs> Rudolph is our museum cur uh, exhibits curator, and she's going to explain to you uh, what happened to all that stuff and why. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've been working hard here. Our first thing, uh, my first of all, I should tell you what we're going to do. This part of our house is going to be a museum. We did not get rid of anything. Uh, we either have it in storage or we're going to use it. Uh, those first three rooms and the middle room that you see the exhibit in today will be our museum. We'll have wall cases and we'll have short cases. Plus we'll put up uh, small exhibits. For instance, we may have a bed to show off our quilts, that type of thing. We may have a family exhibit. Uh, we will have exhibits from the community. There are a lot of people who have collections and would like to show them off. And this will give people the opportunity to do that. Um, some of the furniture that we had here we put over in Lawson House. And you should see that house. It looks very nice. Every, the things we moved in there fit very well. Um, especially our organ. It just fits that house. That is the correct era. Um, We'll leave the kitchen as is. Uh, that is a great little museum in itself. Uh, we'll leave the bathroom and the children's bedroom upstairs so that uh, those can be used for the tours that come here, especially the second graders. Um, they like to see the bedroom, the kitchen, and that sort of thing. But we'll have more for the kids to see now with uh, exhibit rooms they're going to have. And you saw the bright lights. They just were put up today. Uh, they can be dim. They aren't always going to be that bright to have a dimmer on. Um, we have someone who's stripping the wallpaper. The walls will be painted. All of the walls and the trim will be like this room. We're going to make it consistent throughout the building so it looks it all ties together. Um, it's going to take some time. Uh, probably won't be finished till next spring, but it will be time in for our uh, summer Sundays or our open house in the summer. So that's what's going on here. It's a lot of work, but we've had a lot of good people that are helping us too. So if any of you would like to join in and help in any way, we appreciate it. It can be little things. I have things now that have to be done at Lawson House because that house is going to be on a tour of homes for Dickens of a Christmas. Uh, if any of you ladies would like to uh, polish silver or uh, wash some of our china, just dust some things or do anything in that house, we'd welcome it because otherwise we have to hire it done. And it's much nicer if we have volunteers because it take our time and things are done well. So that's it. Do you have any questions? Nancy Kuhn has a formula for cleaning silver that's very easy. <laughs> Oh, you do? Nancy does. Nancy. Oh, oh Nancy. Yeah. Okay. She knows how to do it where you submerge it in hot water and add some solution and it cleans it. Perfect. Okay. I'll well, remember that, Nancy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a really great program tonight. We have with us uh, Professor John Steinbring, uh, who's known as Jack to all, to all of us. Uh, Jack is a nationally uh, known uh, archaeologist who has presented papers on archaeology uh, all over the world. Um, when I was in graduate school, we always thought that archaeology stopped when writing appeared. And after writing appeared in the society, we historians took over because the archaeologists had nothing more of interest to say. <laughs> um, Jack has proved us wrong in that and discovered and his, uh, his exhibits, I hope, which I hope you'll all see out there, show that there's a great deal can be learned about a society using the methods of traditional archaeology and the examination of, of artifacts. 
So, what Jack is going to talk about tonight is a lot about the various kinds of archaeology, including the urban archaeology, the archaeology that he is, uh, archaeological expedition, uh, things that he has done in Ripon, uh, which show us a great deal about our past. So, Jack. Thank you very much. The archaeology of Ripon is really a story of destruction, public official destruction. The sites in Ripon, the vast majority of them, uh, have been destroyed, and there's no archaeology in them. You have to be very formal and pristine about what you think archaeology is uh, if, if you wish to fully understand uh, the problem that we have. Archaeology is a very refined, scientific venture, and it requires that we reconstruct the archaeological sites fully in our minds and in our notes. And so as we excavate, we destroy the site. In this case, our sites have been destroyed for us <laughs> and badly. Uh, so I will enumerate some of the uh, unfortunate conditions, and uh, but you can see for yourselves if you looked at the exhibits that many of the artifacts are only fragments of a, of a full object. So many of the plates are broken in innumerable pieces, and there are captions for everything so you can, in fact, see what they are, if, there, if there's any doubt as to what they are. And I want to thank Donna Marcourt for making many of the uh, captions for them, and that is a multitude of captions. So if you bear with me a minute, I'll see if I can get this machine going here. And by the way, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, then I don't have to use a microphone. Good. Uh, I gotta have a light because I can't see the, see the buttons. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I've only had this two years. <laughs> I'm okay, I think. Okay. There we go. Okay. The origins of Ripon are in Ceresco. Oop, that I didn't want. Okay. Uh, it's it got a mind of its own, obviously. <laughs> I hope that stays. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the area that we're most interested in is the area of Ceresco right in here. And I'll point out some of the highlights. Everybody looks today at the Longhouse and you think, oh boy, that's pretty old. Not. It's about, it was reconstructed in about 1930, 35 along in there. That was the second one on that site. Uh, it's already visible here in 1867, but the original location for the longhouse was right here. And it went, the, uh, that's right, yeah, yeah, right in here. 
and I'll show you a picture of what's there now later. Um, I think this house is probably the house of Edward Daniels. And Edward Daniels was the colonel commanding the 1st Wisconsin Cavalry, which was formed up on College Hill. And he and the, quote, founder, unquote, of Ripon, David P. Mapes, Captain David P. Mapes, he had a tugboat. <laughs> And he liked to call attention to a lot of things that he was interested in, not, not the least of which was his views on slavery. Probably don't know this, but David P. Mapes was in favor of the expansion of slavery uh, at the time of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And he also voted for uh, the Fugitive Slave Law. Mm -hmm. And the people in Soresco were abolitionists to a man. Absolutely every person in the Soresco phalanx, or this utopian experiment, was an abolitionist. And it's very important, if you're viewing the history of Ripon, to bear this in mind, because there is a real cleavage between the upper part of the town and the lower part of the town. There isn't any railroad tracks there. I just have to, you know, think in terms of Soresco. We call ourselves the Soresco Alley Rats. I am a Soresco-ite. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, except for technicalities, born in Soresco. My daddy was born in Soresco, and his daddy was born in Soresco, and his daddy came over on a boat mm -hmm. from the old country. But anyway, there was hostility between the upper town and Soresco, largely because of Mapes' views. These people hated the idea of slavery, and he was willing to accept it. So before you go making wonderful words about uh, the founder of our town, he wasn't perfect <laughs> by a long shot. But anyways, that served to isolate Soresco. And it was already a utopian community with all kinds of uh, special little things that identified it peculiarly, and it was a closed community. You couldn't just get in it. You'd have to go through a bunch of rigmarole in order to get in it. Buying shares, of course, but they wouldn't even let you buy shares unless you were approved by the governing committee. And uh, the fact that it was closed allowed it to have a peculiar potential stance as an underground railway station. And I think that's what it was. Because they had the best possibility for concealing the fact. Because they didn't share every bit of knowledge with everybody else. And they had to worry about Mapes and his cronies because they would turn them in. And in fact, that's what Mapes did. Uh, he engineered the ambush of Booth in the Booth War. Yeah, and bragged about it in his book. You should all read that book. You have a different perspective on, on Mapes. <clears throat> if you didn't believe it, just ask him. <laughs> he, yeah. But anyway, uh, yes, he, he bragged about ambushing Bush, or a uh, booth, uh, and the marshals who uh, arrested Booth stayed in his hotel. And there's a lot of other things that uh, are worth bearing in mind about him. But anyway, this little community down here w was in self-sufficient and a closed community. 
And Edward Daniels, right there, became the commanding officer of the 1st Wisconsin Cavalry by an act of Governor Randall. And he was a hated enemy of Mapes, naturally. And so on the night before the 1st Wisconsin Cavalry took off for the war, they went down and trashed Mapes printing press. <laughs> and because it's actually his son's press, uh, but, but what his son was doing was publishing all his dad's ideas about the abolition movement, which were very negative and, and, and uh, pro-slavery. So they fixed that. And it wasn't too much longer after the start of the Civil War that Mapes left town. Hey, he left town. And he what? Founded Winnicani. And they're all happy about that up there. But they can have him. OK, what else we got here besides Edward Daniels' house? Well, I'm getting ahead of my story, but Edward Daniels' house, a historic site, really, an historic place, was officially destroyed by the city of Ripon to give the firefighters some exercise. And so they burned it down <laughs> as a experiment, a little training, and dumped everything into the basement and smoothed it over real nice and built a house over it, a nice ranch house. Okay, well, what else we got here? Well, you're noticing here an octagonal building. That is not the first Ceresco school. Uh, it is the second. The er original Ceresco school was located right about here. So by 1867, we don't see it on this view. Ah, wait, I'm wrong. This is the Edward Daniels house, and this is probably the old schoolhouse. Uh, it was a, a stone-built schoolhouse, and it served both the school, because the Ceresco Phalanx members were very interested in education, and they, and they were very literate. They had many magazines and journals and newspapers, especially the uh, New York Tribune, which gave them a lot of ideas about phalanxes and other interesting experiments. Um, anyway, uh, that's probably the school right there. The first building it was this one here, which is still standing in 67, still standing today, partly. Uh, they cobbled together, first, they built one building to accommodate the few people that first came. And then they added to it, kind of like a you know, what, add-on, and uh, then built the first of longhouses, which went in right here. And I suspect that in 1846, that building burned down, and they rebuilt it. So what you're looking at over here on this longhouse that we see today is the fourth longhouse. All right, what else we got? Well, we got this little octagon building right here with a cupola on it, which has recently been added. Uh, that was built by the, the blacksmith of the uh, Ceresco Phalanx. And let's see, that's his blacksmith shop right there. Uh, it's, what's left of it is underneath the Pizza Hut? Yeah. Pizza Hut, yeah. Okay, good old Pizza Hut. Um, this, yeah, this is built by I Jacob Woodruff, who was the blacksmith, in uh, 1850. When the phalanx uh, disbanded, they didn't give everybody a bunch of money. Actually, uh, their, their idea was not to use money. And they didn't, didn't use much money. They bartered. This was a system that they had. And so when Jacob Woodruff took his 
dividends, uh, he got this whole block. All of that right there. And he also got berry bush. See the orchards up here? Well, that, that's what the phalanx people specialized in. Uh, they specialized in berries, apples, and grapes. And so Jacob Woodruff put in a lot of grapevines in here. I can remember that as a child, I can remember grape, grapevines right in here. And I think there might still be some right about in here. Anyway, uh, at one time, Woodruff got together with a guy by the name of Wright, and they had a winery on this property here. Uh, and um, it lasted exactly one year. Now, I don't, think, I don't think that that's necessarily Jacob Woodruff's fault because the guy he went in partnership with, Mr. Wright, was a partner with Mr. Brayton, and they had a pharmacy downtown. There's one of the bottles is over there in the exhibits, Wright and Brayton, pharmacist, Rippon, and that lasted one year. So I'm not perfectly sure it was all Woodruff's fault. Um, this here, uh, a lot of people will not remember this. This is the mill race for one of the mills, which was situated about here. This is the Ceresco uh, mill pond. And the flue went across the road and down here and into a, a mill, which I don't know if it was way down here, but it, it was around in here someplace. Maybe that's just an artist's sketch of it, and it probably went farther. Uh, but at any rate, there were many mills. There were mills out on uh, the roads back here uh, near uh, Arcade. And uh, then there were many mills up in the eastern part of uh, Silver Creek. Um, I should say a word about roads. Ceresco was a hub. There was the Dartford Road, which went to Green Lake. There was the Berlin Road, which went to Berlin and the Fox River. Uh, there was the Oshkosh Road. Uh, there was the Fond du Lac Road. And there was the, Dart, uh, the uh, Watertown Road. And that went right up here, around this way, up here and out along South Woods and off towards Watertown. Now, what that does, there's five roads coming into this one hub. And that has to enormously increase uh, the communications. And so they were getting information from everywhere. And this comes up in the building of the Octagon House. Because Woodruff built that of grout. And grout had been earlier invented by Joseph Goodrich in Milton, Wisconsin. And there he built a hexagonal, hexagonal temperance inn. <laughs> I th it, maybe a lot of you don't know this, but Joseph Goodrich, for one year, was a member of the Ceresco Phalanx. He never got to Ceresco, but I'm sure the information about his grout construction did. And apart from other theories on that, I'll stick with the connections that Woodruff had all around and especially to the south. And also, what way did the slaves come? <laughs> okay, uh, they, they certainly came up through this way. We know that there's a station at Alto, there's a station at Fond du Lac, there's a station at Pickett. Uh, there are many stations around here, and I think that the Ceresco Phalanx functioned as a major station. Uh, there was a station master there uh, by the name of Morse, and his son was interviewed <coughs> uh, uh, early on, I'd say about the 1920s or 30s, and he explained that his dad had been the uh, station master for the Underground Railroad at Ceresco. 
So anyway, um, what else can I tell you? Uh, well, okay, we'll see this again. This building, which probably faced on Union Street, is not an ordinary building. That's a really big building. I class it as a mansion. And so in 1995, when the Ceresco School was demolished, mm -hmm. by whom? City of Ripon to make a development, yeah. Um, we found all kinds of stuff, it's, it's in the exhibits, all kinds of stuff that had nothing, nothing to do with school. Well, you had slate tablets in every family. I mean, everybody had a slate tablet. But uh, very uh, high-grade pottery. Staffordshire transfer prints, um, all kinds of great stuff, in, including, as you'll see a little later, um, signs of Aboriginal connections. Um, 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 I think I've worn that one out. Okay, we'll try something else. All right. Oh, I got to go back. I got to show you something else. It's all right. I'll come back. This is an interesting thing up here. What is this? It's a house on a hill. Uh-huh. That is Ripon's Gothic house. You didn't know that? No, I bet you didn't. But anyway, when they were researching the, the papers on this house, they discovered that it was called the Ripon Gothic House. And as they were doing uh, some restoration work, they found Gothic windows, just like that, in it. Inside the walls and stuff, it had all been covered up, and there had been a number of fires, and most of the place had been <coughs> rearranged. So that is Ripon's Gothic House. I wrote an article in the paper about it. Some of you might see that. And that's what it might have looked like. This is another tragedy. This one we don't have to take blame for. We can blame Fond du Lac for this. This is the Gothic house at Fond du Lac as it looks right today. And it's, be, it's deteriorated terribly. Uh, there's been vandalism. And I don't know why nobody has stepped forward to try to do something about that. It really perplexes me because such an a exotic and, and beautiful uh, building, the, the Farmer Gothic, I think is what they call it, but uh, it had a lot of bric-a-brac on it, and, and the back end of it is really, really a mess. Okay, now where is the, the Watertown Road? Well, it's right there. That's the Gothic house is one of these up here. That's the Watertown Road, and you can see it hits Liberty Street right here. And I have, I have a picture of the east, no, the south end of the Watertown Road. As you can see it, I'll just hand it around. And while we're doing that, we can listen to Frank Farber having a word about the Watertown Road. Maybe we won't. Yeah, it was built of stone in the manner of a um, stone bridge with a keystone in the center. This is a that. feature he found on the Watertown Road. This would probably be of great interest to you. Uh, I didn't walk up to it. I didn't uh, look in. Uh, there was a visible void, at least near the top. It was probably dinner full of dirt. Uh, but uh, it was there, and I never paid a hell of a lot of attention to it. John Split so, and I found uh, it. I don't believe that it's underground. I think it is possible. If one were to go up there at the right time of year, such as right now, with little or no foliage, <laughs> you might be able to walk right up to the goddamn thing and see it, unless <laughs> some idiot fool of recent time has destroyed it. Tip but typical. I would guess that the percentage uh, possibility is quite good that it can be recovered and uh, studied. Uh, as I say, uh, I did set corners of the, the western corners of Lot 1 uh, would have been 
dimensions set. Um, because I used the dimension, I had to calculate the dimensions of the of that line between lot one and two on the basis of the dimensions. So the you see the south line of lot two is given a dimension, the north line of lot one has a dimension, and uh, the uh, north south dimension is given. And I was able, I had to bring in an angle for those corners because for all of uh, Capron's work, uh, these he Capron is a first that these surveyor. Angles are 90 degrees, well, they're not. Um, they're uh, a little bit off in each case. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I did generate uh, a direction for a bearing, that is, uh, for uh, the east line of this Watertown Road, and to the best of my knowledge, did monument uh, those corners. And um, so that much has been done, and I, I don't believe anybody's going to go in there and do any better work than I did on it, because they're <laughs> going to be limited by the same things that limited me. And... Uh, Therefore, they're, they're certainly not going to be able to do any better than I did. <laughs> Typical Frank, eh? <laughs> okay, there, we've seen the Watertown Road. It's there, and Frank testifies to its being there, so what, what more do you need? Okay, okay this is the... Uh, the it's my daughter's house. <laughs> okay. She's living in the oldest building. 1846. Uh, uh, no, it would be 1844 or 45, mm -hmm. uh, because that was the location of their earliest building. And they arrived in 1844, and they surely would not have built it any later than 1845. Uh, on the paperwork, maybe they're off a year. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that, uh, that stuff is farther off than that. But in the basement of this, I'm told, I did not see it, uh, that some of the bake ovens uh, were, were still in it. And that, that's exceptional. You can tell where they were. Um, the Steins who owned the house. Yes. I cemented the ovens off. Okay. So there's a yeah. ridge in there where the ovens were mm -hmm. and the tops were. Yeah. That was the only non-British um, member of the phalanx was the cook, and he was German. All the rest were from New England or from Canada. Is it possible to focus that one? No. No, I'm sorry. Th these are secondary pictures. <laughs> well, there you see the longhouse of 1846. Oh, well, this is the, this is the one, that, the, the number four one. Yeah, okay, I can get back to that. That's the exact location of the original longhouse. And that's where they... Um, church. Yeah, that's Church Street. Uh, and that, that's where they did the uh, fire drill. Mm -hmm. And this is, as I say, the fourth longhouse, or probably the fourth longhouse. They call it the President's House. So they built it while Warren Chase was still around. He left uh, probably about 1854. He built an octagon house on, on um, State Street in 1853. And um, that was destroyed in 1912. Uh, but uh, it was a frame building. And the other octagons are all uh, grout, including one on the west end of Liberty Street on the south side. Uh, which was destroyed in, I believe it was 1960. I can't remember for sure. Okay, as a feature I wanted to call your attention. Well, two features. One, one of them uh, is a discovery my wife made. Uh, this four-panel pane around the front door, that's a feature of the 1850s. And you'll notice that on the Octagon House in Ripon, there is a, a double panel of four panes on, on each side. It's called an Adam Surround, but it's a corrupted Adam Surround because it's uh, diminished in, uh, what do you say, uh, elaboration uh, over, the t over time. And right here, <clears throat> when the demolition of Soresco took place, uh, of course, a lot of it 
was due to electrical conduits and plumbing uh, rearrangements and curb and gutter and parking lot and God knows what else. But right here, as they were putting in the uh, conduit, they discovered a, a, a bell-shaped brick cistern. Now, and there's pictures of one at the Octagon House in there. But my wife saw the dirt going down and she said, hey, down? Dirt shouldn't fall <laughs> down when you're digging. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what it was. And that has never since been found. I don't know why. I looked for it once or twice. Jeff Quilter looked for it. Uh, and it's just never been rediscovered. <laughs> well, there you are. That's the Ceresco site. Look at the neat archaeological excavation. <laughs> the pristine, the beauty of it. <clears throat> City of Ripon. Destroying another heritage site. In a city that prides itself on heritage. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, anyway, there's a lot of stuff. And I think this is Jeff Coulter right here. Uh, th th this is Mrs. Farver, Frank Farver's wife. Uh, this is uh, Dick Mason, who at that time and still is, the president of the Ritz and Cellar chapter of the Wisconsin Archaeological Society. That guy I don't know. But uh, anyway, they're talking over the mess. And it was a mess. Now, this don't look like much, but it is something. This is probably the best archaeological site for revealing the Ceresco phalanx than any other in the city. This is at 45 Union Street. And it belongs to a lady by the name of Joyce Huth. I don't see her here. But anyway, Dr. Quilter and his crew excavated right next to this garage, right in here. And they did a half circle, and they dug everything down to as low as it would go, and it was an extremely rich deposit. A major collective de uh, refuse deposit in a pit. And he could only go halfway. So he got the stuff from this half, but the other half is underneath Joyce Hoos garage. And I think the city should buy her a new garage and let us excavate that site. <laughs> as, a, as a token of goodwill in a heritage community. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll have we'll more. Watch the pig slide. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I would just point out these octagons. One there, one there, and there's another one on State Street, and this is it right here. It's just west of Maple Street, and they make a kind of a north line, don't they? That's uh, something to uh, speculate about. The other octagon was built later, and that, no, nope, there it is. That's it. Frank and I always argued ex about exactly where it was. I can remember it, of course. But anyway, okay. Um, okay, this, we're now going to go into looking at the uh, Ceresco School uh, issue. This is the location of the Ceresco School right here. That would be the one after this. It was built in, um, uh, it burned down in 1912. So I don't know how long it had been in existence, but it had been in existence for some time. And uh, then it was rebuilt as a um, Dutch revival. You know, the brick buildings in Holland, and they have this round thing in the front, sort of fake fronts that have rounded parts to them. Okay, well, that's what this was, and it was demolished <clears throat> in uh, 1995. 
and then this, what remained the half of this part of the lot, well, lots was made, put into a, a, a development. Uh, but anyway, that, that's what I wanted to point out with this picture. It's this uh, thing right here, this big house. And the materials from it are in the exhibits. And this is what it looked like. Um, these were deep refuse piles that had been burned. And you can see that's right where they are in that level. And they went all around, They're an enormous pile of them. But the most interesting artifact in, in these excavations, or what I should salvage work, is this. No, it doesn't look like much of anything, does it? Nah. Well, it's soapstone, and it's squarish, and it's got cross hatching on it, made by a metal tool. And there's the end of it, right there. The other end's broken off. What do you think it was? Pipe. pipe. Right on, pipe. What kind of pipe? An aboriginal pipe. And that's what it would have looked like. And why isn't this one black? Because the black hadn't gone on it yet. These have been colored with stove blacking, shoe polish, charcoal. They wanted them to be black, but they made them on a gray, whitish gray stone. And it was nice to be black. And so that's what they did with them. I, 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 uh, I and another guy collected the world's largest collection of Aboriginal Ojibwa stone pipes. They look just like this. In fact, these are some of them before they were stolen. The whole collection was stolen. And um, I even went out and interviewed the people that made them and found the deposits of the steatite that they made them from. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's soft, and you can use a saw, ordinary, everyday saw. You cut right through it and make yourself a stone pipe, if you're so inclined. This is the Jacob Woodruff House, uh, built in 1850. And it's built of grout. There are 20 tiers of it, 20 layers. And you stop to think they had to do that in dry weather, because <laughs> if it rained on it, it would disintegrate. So they had 20 good days in the year that they made that. This is an old porch that was on the back of the house. We came back here from Canada, where I worked for many years, uh, in 1994. And um, we took a good look at the north end of it, which had been rented. The whole house had been rented for 25 years. And uh, those of you that know the results of long-term <laughs> rentals <laughs> will realize that maybe it wasn't so good anymore. And you no, know, it wasn't. And in fact, the only thing we could do with it was to tear it down. And we did. We tore the whole north end, they're called L, it's E-L-L. -L. And we tore that all off. And since we were then getting underneath the porch, which had been covering up that door. Here are the Ripon College students. They were conducting the excavation. It was an archaeological field school for credit. And that was the excavation that took place there. And one of the interesting things that's in the exhibit was a percussion cap, which was right down here underneath the step for the side door. And what does that tell you? Percussion caps are expended when they are exploded. And they drop wherever you are. And so somebody fired a gun from this door. Were they shooting a chicken? 
out there in the backyard? Well, I've done that. Not here. <laughs> but yes, I think that's exactly what happened. I think they were shooting at some, something out there, uh, and the cap fell down below in that material. This is a cap. Um, oop, wrong one. That's not it. OK, this is a cap uh, for an unused well. <clears throat> and it was located right, let's see, right about here, right in this area here. And it capped a stone laid well, which I believe was done by a Mr. Cooper, who was the last surviving member of the Iron Brigade, Brigade. Oh Rippon. And he lived on West Fond du Lac Street, which is what, three doors away? Mm -hmm. About three doors away, and he was listed in the directory as a well digger. So it's not hard to infer that he might have dug this well. That's not the well. This is the bell-shaped cistern that came up underneath the debris of the L. And there's something strange about it because there's no, no artifacts in it. Billy Hutton got down in there <laughs> and, and dug as far as he could go, which was he cleaned it out. And there wasn't a single artifact in it. That's extremely rare because openings like that are a magnet to garbage. <laughs> Any kind of garbage, broken bottles, place, whatever. And there wasn't anything in there. But there was an opening just over here into the back of the house in the basement that has been rebricked up and would have led directly to this. And so a theory is that this was used to harbor slaves. This might well have been, the theory is not my own, I robbed somebody else of it. Uh, but. It's not an implausible idea, because surely Jacob Woodruff was an ardent abolitionist. And he was on the committee which originally formed the Republican Party, which was an anti-slavery party. The Democrats, by the way, were not anti-slavery. That's changed. Um, <laughs> Here, here was a sidewalk <coughs> leading to nowhere. Hey, what's this? There's a sidewalk. Where's it going? It goes there and he stops. There's nothing. It led to the privy. It led to the privy. And so the, the archaeological field school started digging in the privies. And there must be at least 100 artifacts out there in the exhibit that came out of that privy. Very, very rich. And the original pharmaceutical bottles from the city of Ripon, they were in that privy. People throw stuff in the privy for a variety of reasons. In those days, bottles were nothing. Everybody had bottles galore, and you just went to a drugstore and got your bottle and used it up and threw it away, just as it would throw plastic away today. And that's why you've got pristine bottles like E.J. Burnside with a beautiful logo on it, and um, the um, uh, Shallon uh, Pharmacy, and Wright and Brayton, who lived one year. Okay. So, uh, and there's the cupola, which was actually a ventilator, uh, for the Ceresco School uh, that was built in 1914. And uh, the Construction people allowed me to have it, and so Billy Hutton and I, we hauled it over to our backyard, and it's still there. But it's kind of a remembrance of the old octagonal school uh, on Park Street. And I think that's what they originally did. Now we're going into the upper town. Okay. This is the Congregational Church. And right here is a building that we know existed before 1867. And another one was built here before 1892. And right in here was an extremely rich 
archaeological site, maybe burn piles, maybe a number of burn piles. Oh, I could point out some more sites. Let me see. Uh, yeah, that's the Amon Mansion right there. Uh, East Hall, Middle Hall, West Hall. I can't keep up with the renaming of them. <laughs> and there is the North Ransom Street site. <laughs> and it is being destroyed by the city of Ripon mm -hmm. to make a what? Mm -hmm. Parking lot. Yes, that's right. And uh, we stood in front of the bulldozers, Donna Marquardt and I. <laughs> and there she is to, to prove it. <laughs> this, is, this is the richest part of the site. It was just innumerable bottles and stuff. And um, there were intact deposits which could have been technically excavated, but there was no opportunity. They would allow me no time. But they said, we'll fix it for you. So they got truckloads, 13 truckloads of this site and took them out to the um, uh, industrial. Industrial, industrial park. park. Yeah. And so the 13 piles, they got rained on a few times and I went out there and collected some stuff from them. Now stuff is not archeology, span it's collecting. You can, do, you, can, you can collect match folders, right? Or what, beer caps or anything. That's, a, that's an important point. This is not archaeology. In a sense, it is. But formal archaeology, something far different than this. Uh, but anyway, after a few rains, it was exhausted. The surface of these 13 piles, nice cone-shaped piles, very neat. And they, um, the guys, not, not, the, not the officials, but the guys that were doing it, had done that, pushed it all out and smoothed it out and made a great big open area of it. I forgot the d exact dimensions, but like 100 feet long and maybe 75 feet wide or something like that. I know I calculated um, the, the miles that I had walked when I canvassed that. And I walked at least 100 miles, absolutely, as I went back and forth uh, collecting materials that had been strewn all over the place uh, from the North Ransom Street site. It was a very rich site. There it is today. <laughs> Looks a lot different, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. One of the things we found there was this, it's in the cases, Wyeth and Brothers, Philadelphia. Name familiar? Very famous family of artists. But not all artists. <laughs> Some of them sold drugs. <laughs> this pretty rare piece uh, came from that site. Uh, it's a ceramic inkwell. And you don't see ceramic inkwells very much. They're, they're fairly rare. Uh, condiment bottles, uh, not condiment, um, cosmetic bottles. Yeah, they're, they're, I, I'm not going to bother. You can see what they are. I've got a thing where I could turn it around. Okay, uh, here's a, um, a musical uh, thing, a thing to hold, hold music on a horn or some, some type of uh, instrument in a band. And so Main Street's what? Half a block away. So this may be some, somebody that was in a band marching up and down Main Street just a short distance away. And uh, it, it fell into disrepute. Okay, what's the next one? Well, the next one, uh, we can't blame on the city. <clears throat> this is West Hall, and it doesn't look at anything like West Hall, except it's probably got the right number of windows. Uh, and on the west side of West Hall, about 1990, I think, I can't remember exactly, but uh, they were digging some, uh, digging a trench to put in a conduit. And, uh, hey, what's all this stuff coming out of the whole ground like this? Well, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to fix that for you, if I can find a way to do it. No, no, wrong one. Uh, 
No. Ah, there we are. Okay, it was a, another case of standing in front of the bulldozers. I, I, I'm really getting tired at age 82. I don't want to stand in front of any bulldozers anymore. I think, I, I think I've earned, uh, earned some rest. But anyway, they hit a, a very rich archeological deposit right in here. And we did attempt to do some formal work there. I think we got about one unit in. These are one meter by one meter squares and you take them down and evaluate the stratigraphy as best you can. And in this case, we did get some interesting information and uh, it's uh, all written up somewhere. Among the things we found there, well, this is a uh, harmonica. Yeah, and this is a clay pipe. So they were still using clay pipes there. It had been a dormitory. Uh, it had been a music school, uh, it had been a library. I can't remember all the things it had been, but it had been a lot of things. And uh, these clay pipes uh, were persisted into the 1940s because I can remember Litke's Tobacco Store over here on Main Street, and uh, they were selling them for 25 cents each. And they had a great big glass jar, and you could dip in there and get one. And they get very long stems, stems are about this long. And of course, uh, they're easily broken. And so we can, we can identify the timing of some sites on the basis of the presence of, uh, of these, uh, these clay pipes, kaolinite, they call it. Anyway, um, there is one that I found while digging uh, some sites in Canada uh, that pertain to the uh, fur trade. And the Winnipeg River is one of the main arteries of the fur trade. And I was digging some forts and stuff in, on, on the Winnipeg River. And we got a pipe that had on it Bannerman, Montreal. And we know the exact location of the Bannerman Company. We know the years that it, it worked. And so we know that when they got that pipe, I mean, it didn't last long. I mean, these pipes, in fact, the voyageurs would bite off uh, most of the pipe <laughs> in order, to, because they knew it was going to break anyway. And, it's, and, it, and the closer you get to the, uh, to the, the pipe uh, bowl, uh, the more uh, strength it has. So they, um, they bit it off to avoid big trouble later, maybe fall out of their boat. But um, uh, we were able to identify the location as to timing on the basis of the time period that the Bannerman Company worked uh, in Montreal. Uh, this is another object that, that, that uh, was a piece of furniture. It's a caster. It's porcelain. And it's an early style. So it's an empire style. And you could, you could uh, put that back to about 1850, maybe even a little earlier. Uh, its presence in that uh, pit or in that deposit um, makes you think that since we know West Hall wasn't built until when? 1867. And so uh, this was coming from somewhere before that. And there was a lot of things in that site that reflected that earlier time period. So it, it was a dump that was used by Middle Hall before West Hall was built. And not only that, it's a funny story in a way, Katina Lilios was an archeologist at Ripon College and she and her husband would like to uh, walk out to South Woods and up around the hills and everything. And one day she came back and she says, hey Jack, I think we found a site up there. I said, yeah. And she told me where it was. And went up there and there was a bunch of piles, just, just like the North Ransom Street piles out in the industrial park, same thing. And sure, they were uh, making a parking lot <laughs> between West Hall and Middle Hall. And they're going to put blacktop on it, make it nice. And so they had to dig it all out. And they dug out a site and took it up there on the hills out uh, on the uh, western uh, part of town, uh, uh, south, uh, north of uh, South Woods. 
Well, I, I haven't talked a little at all about prehistoric archaeology. Everything I've said is about historic archaeology, and of course it's vitally interesting, and I, and I love it, but uh, I, uh, my reputation is, is far more uh, fixed on, on what we call prehistoric rock art. And uh, I've written a lot of papers on prehistoric rock art. What's that? Well, that's uh, engravings on rock formations and paintings on rock formations and in caves and all such like. So anyway, uh, my wife and I were driving around Arcade Glen one day. And we both looked over to the side and said, hey, you know, these are the conditions where we find prehistoric engravings elsewhere. And there they are. That is a prehistoric engraving site. These are ellipses. I think there are seven of them, with something else too. And um, they're protected by this overhang right here. And there are hundreds of sites like this, but this is the most easterly one in North America. You go west from here and you go out around La Crosse, and there are quite a few sites that have these uh, elliptical uh, grooves. It's a grooving site. I call it a grooving site. Uh, and so a lot of times people say, well, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, for sharpening tools. And there is a cave site out in western Wisconsin where all the engravings are on the ceiling of the cave. And that's a kind of a strange way of sharpening your tools. This is a bad picture, but it shows them a little closer up. This is the perfect one that hasn't been eroded, but this is exactly what they look like. They go as far west as um, Colorado. I'm trying to remember the name of the type station. Well, there is a type station in South Dakota that has nothing but these, and they take great pains uh, <coughs> there not to uh, impinge on the next one. So there's some sort of a taboo which uh, uh, eliminates the chance that you would touch somebody else's work. And that, that's sometimes a very powerful uh, taboo. But anyway, Ripon does have one prehistoric engraving site. And it was a, just a chance thing. We'd seen so many of these we knew exactly what it was. Were they for? Yeah, good question. Don't know. <laughs> it's like, like my old geology professor, Cargis, a very, very respected geologist at Oshkosh, where I did my undergraduate work. And kids would come up to him with a rock and he'd say, Dr. Cargis, what is this? And he'd look at it and he'd say, FRDK. FRDK, what's that? Freak rock, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, prehistor prehistoric. This is the south end of Rush Lake. And you can see there are quite a few. Frank had uh, worked on this map, and you can see there's Winnebago 4, which is the old Kaler site. And uh, there's the Radke Dunham site here. And uh, I can't remember this one, but they're all in my master's thesis, and you can all go and look at it and read it because it's just like reading a telephone book. <laughs> okay. um, the, the really exciting news about Rush Lake is the Henderson Creek site. The Hendersons came here starting in Scotland, and then they came into uh, Canada, and they moved from Canada to Rush Lake. And uh, this was in 1845. And they started the first farm, right, let's see. Yeah, right, right about here, or Henderson Creek. This is Henderson Creek, right here, like that. And the farm would have been located right here. And I think they owned a fair bit of the land right in there. It's the old frog farm, some of you remember that. Uh, <coughs> anyway. This is the uh, collection from uh, Rush Lake that uh, this gentleman here and his daughter and I don't know who else uh, collected many thousands of artifacts. I think something like 26,000. 
And there are some of the artifacts in the case over there. You can look at them. Uh, I picked these out because uh, they represent a very early horizon in, in North American archaeology. These are called gravers. And gravers have these little spurs on them. They're intentionally produced. And sometimes they're made on the end of a scraping tool. There's bilateral spurs. Um, and these are always associated with Paleo-Indian culture, which is the oldest identifiable culture in North America. So these are probably <coughs> right around 10,000 years old. And uh, there's a lot of stuff at Rush Lake that's 10,000 years old. In fact, there are Clovis fluted projectile points. I think I've, these aren't Clovis, but they're, they're eared. The ear's been broken off of this one, it's been broken off of this one. It'd be bilateral and symmetrical. Um, but there is a Clovis point uh, from the Rush Lake Road, I can't remember, Pulaski, the Pulaski place. And uh, that was found back in the early days and Frank lived across the street. And uh, he got wind of this and we took pictures of it and everything. And I, I don't think it's yet been sold by the people that found it, but uh, it will date to 11,200 plus four, five hundred, whatever. Uh, so these will maybe go 10,000 years, but uh, probably not much more than that. This is a material called Hickstonite. It's a uh, fancy name for uh, silicified sandstone, which is a form of quartzite. And this all comes from one place, the Silver Mound site near Alma. Wisconsin, which is in western Wisconsin. And this is a very high grade quartzite. It's workable. Uh, Jeff Baim over at Oshkosh uh, has experimented with it and found it useful and workable. And it has many, many color variations. So when you find one, uh, say a tan one like this, and a, a black one, maybe like this, you have a hard time thinking that they came from the same site, but they did. This is one quarry, and all of the variations are right in that quarry. And these are off, this material is often used uh, in the production of early man artifacts in Wisconsin, especially the Scotts Bluff type, if any of you know what the Scotts Bluff type is. Uh, it's maybe about 9,000 years old, 8.5 to 9 to 9.5, something like that. And practically every one of the Scotts Bluff points in Wisconsin is made from this material. I'm coming near the end. Uh, this is stuff from the Henderson Creek site. And this is a broken bottle, but very thick and a dark blackish green. These are the early ones. These would be, and this is a pontal mark right here. This is a broken off from the base of a, of a, of a uh, bottle. And the pontal mark is where the glass blower uh, has the pontal, which is the rod that they use on the molten glass uh, to form a bottle. So that's early stuff. Um, yeah, ceramic uh, uh, earthenware, crocks, uh, there are thousands and thousands of them among all of the sites. I know uh, the, the most prolific source of uh, these earthenware pots was the Billy Hutton site. <laughs> and the Billy Hutton site uh, was located right back of Billy Hutton's old store, uh, which was more recently Tracy Porter's. Okay? And this was another case. Uh, the city came in there with a bulldozer, and I stood in front of the bulldozer, and I said, stop. And he did stop for a little while, and then he called the city hall, and the city hall sent two cops down. I was in my 70s at the time, sent two cops down to get me out of there because I was trying to salvage artifacts. So I paid a good price uh, for trying to preserve Ripon's uh, heritage. And yeah, a lot of thanks for it, too. But um, Billy's site had innumerable uh, earthenware crocks. It was a mercantile uh, establishment, and it, ha it had e an enormous amount of material. Billy's got a lot of it at home. He's still got it. 
And so there can be something said about it. And oh, yeah, I like this one because it's got the toys in it. And these are probably uh, the Henderson children uh, from the 1850s. And how do we know that? Because of the hairdos on these dollies. That's a typical 1850s hairdo. This one here, she lost her hair. Yeah. There's one. This is probably pretty good. This one here was even uh, painted, but it's, it's underglazed painting. And eyes are painted in. Uh, there's a uh, uh, earthenware marble with uh, a painted decoration, some kind of a little vase, uh, a shoe, piece of a pipe, some dolly's leg, and some of the ceramics. This is often called Clo Blue. And some of you that are familiar with uh, crockery uh, will say, yeah, that's Flo Blue. But the real Flo Blue is actually a corrugated rim. Uh, the paint is allowed to seep in between the ridges on the corrugations. And that's how it first got its name. Most of the literature is wrong. Sorry, but it's wrong. And um, it was, of course, researched uh, infinitely uh, by uh, Canadian researchers. And uh, they know a lot more about uh, Staffordshire ceramics than we do. Uh, they're really, really up to speed on that. In fact, uh, one of my students became one of the ranking national experts on uh, early ceramics. And this is the Henderson sword. It's in the, in the exhibit case, but it's not a sword. Yeah, you say, hey, it looks like a sword. No. It is a saber. And there is a technical difference. This has only one blade edge. And there is a flat back. Okay. This one, the, the handle is gone. Steve Reimer found this, handed it over to me. Also, Kevin Shipman was on the internet. And uh, it was found on 616 South Grove Street. That's correct. While Steve was doing some drywalling. That's right. Yep. Steve's a city dry, drywall man. A pantry, okay. And there it was behind behind the cabinetry, and uh, it. I I then got thirty books, believe it or not, thirty, of uh, uh, interlibrary loan from Ripon uh, Municipal Library, and I mean they were really all out, and they got all these books for me, and I got them from England and everywhere else, to find out what the heck it was. Well, it turned out it was a cavalry saber. It was made by Hetke and Hernan. These would be cutlers. That was a, the cutlers were a, um, what do you call it, a, a guild. And it would be from the community of Sackville in London. They couldn't <coughs> pin it down, and I went to the British Museum to find out. But uh, you could not pin it exactly. But the lettering on it is late 18th century, early 19th century lettering. And we would then tentatively date it at about 1800. Well, what's it doing in 616 South Grove Street? Huh? Well, it turns out that the final echelon, the final <laughs> generation of the Hendersons Bought that house in 1904. It was built in 1902. Maybe nobody lived in it until 1904, but that's when the Henderson got there. And this was a family heirloom that they had, and it was still in the house. To go from that, well, we know that they came from Scotland. Uh, I'm sure that they acquired it while they were in Scotland. They went to Canada, came here, started, well, they already had a family, two, two boys and one girl. And one of those boys went into the Civil War in the cavalry. 
And so I suspect that he probably carried that sword in the Civil War and um, kept it as an heirloom. And Steve found it in, what, 1990 or 2010 or... <laughs> Five, yeah. yeah, long in there, yeah. yeah and there it is. <laughs> yeah, well, it 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 told us it it really told us a great story, and we're really indebted to you for that. And there's where it was found in that that house right there. And that's full circle, and I'm done. <laughs> But I'll answer questions, or try. Uh, so, yeah. Those at the dig at Soresco, how deep are those article, articles found? How much? Oh, that's that's a deep pit. That that pit would be about this deep. I mean, is that uh, that gets covered over time? Is well, it gets it's covered periodically uh, by lime, ashes, clay, sand, whatever's handy. Uh, to eliminate the odors. And the same thing applies to privies. You'll find a, nor uh, uh, a normal stratigraphy in the privies uh, to, because of this uh, constant deposit of material to... Well, I guess I was wondering just how long does it take for something to be buried and how, how much material would you find over something just naturally as it lays on the ground, if you follow what I'm saying. I mean, if there's two feet of earth above an artifact, can you say that's generally maybe a hundred years of Well, the rule, rule we often use uh, for a humus, and it, like black earth, organic earths, is that you, it takes about 500 years uh, to develop a, a good solid inch of it. <coughs> so if you found stuff that's a foot and a half down your, if, if it's normal, that it's not been disturbed in any way. There are in, infinite ways in which it can be disturbed, including surface drainage. Yeah. Jack, if the mayor gave you a shovel and he said, you can go anywhere you want, <laughs> where, where would you dig? There's got to be some I'd, places I'd, in reference I would, to I would go straight to Joyce Hooth's house. <laughs> <laughs> the and demolish the garage and tear up the concrete and go for the rest of the history of the origins of the city of Ripon and Soresco. That's what I would do. There's other nice places too, but that's my We're favorite. We're talking about Soresco. What about this end of town? Well, uh, you know, we think we, we know where David P. Mapes built his first cabin. And it's very close uh, to where the new park is. There's a building there that's been more or less uh, protected because Billy Hutton went up and put a roof on it. It was leaking pretty bad. And some of the original windows were in there, and they're, of course, early glass. And there was deposits around the building. Uh, they had uh, gotten bulldozers in there, and that was another case, uh, standing in front of the building to say, stop, you know. And... Um, but uh, we turned that one over to Ripon College, and I think that's when Emily Stovall first came. And I believe they did go up there and try to conduct some excavations. Um, that would be a useful, that whole area along uh, Douglas Street would be useful because uh, Mapes identified a spring. There, there are a number of springs there, but the best one is right near the road. And it's, it's a free-flowing, nice spring. And in the early, like, say, May, April, May, uh, there's loads of watercress in it. And that's usually an indication of relatively cold water, direct water, and uh, fairly clean water. So that, that, that might well be the spring that Mapes was talking about in his, in his journals and in his book. Well, okay, so it's me. Mm -hmm.